Uh, we're going to walk you through the Community Gaming Grants Capital Project Sector Grant uh, program this morning. And um, so just uh, by way of introduction, let's bring up our agenda for this morning. Just very quickly, what we're going to talk you through today is uh, a few things. So just in terms of an introduction, a little bit of an introduction to the sector itself, the capital project sector. We'll talk to you a little bit about the application process itself. Any of you who are familiar with the Community Gaming Grants program, the main program that we offer, uh, it's a little bit different, this one. It's a competitive process. We'll talk to you about that. And we're going to talk to you about the eligibility requirements. There's a series of uh, mandatory eligibility requirements that you're going to need to make sure that you can tick those boxes off in order to uh, potentially be eligible for this program. And then we're going to talk to you about the assessment piece of it. So if you're screened in, if you meet the mandatory eligibility, uh, the next phase of the process will be an actual formal assessment of your application. So that's where we lay out all the applications on a table, really, really big table, and go through all of them and, and, uh, and sort of uh, tick off uh, how each of them does according to a series of uh, assessment pieces that David will talk to you about a little bit later. We're also going to do a live demo for you. So those of you who um, are sticking around for the whole thing, good on you. You're going to watch a demo that Stephanie's going to do to show you how you actually do apply for this program. Um, and we're also going to talk to you a little bit about if you're successful, what is the accountability for this program? So what are some things that you're eligible to actually spend the funds on? And how do you report back to us at the end of each year of the cycle how you've actually spent the funds? So we'll talk to you about that. And as I mentioned before, we're also going to leave some time at the end to answer any questions you have, uh, specific questions you have about the program. So remember to keep that chat function in mind. If you have some questions, um, that's your space to, uh, to post those questions for us. So that's our agenda. Um, so just to begin, let's talk to you a little bit about the sector itself. So the first thing that I wanted to mention is uh, you can see on the screen here, there is a link to our website, the Community Gaming Grants website, the HTTP site you can see there below the computer icon. That's the site that you're going to want to go to to find out all the details about not only the regular Community Gaming Grants program, but also this program in particular. Stephanie will take you on a little tour of it later, but just make note of that site. Everything that we're going to share with you this morning is actually based on materials that are also posted on our site. So you don't need to memorize this, uh, but it's a good idea for you to go back to that site uh, and check out the different documents. One document in particular that you're going to want to look at in regards to this program we're talking about today is the Capital Project Sector Guide. So you're going to find that on the site. The content we're sharing with you today is pretty much primarily based on information you're going to find in that Capital uh, Project Sector Guide. So the sector itself. So if you're familiar with the regular Community Gaming Grant Program, if you've applied for that program, one of the things that you will know about the regular Community Gaming Grant Program is that you can make a request for minor capital projects up to a value of $20,000. So if, uh, if your program, programming that you deliver, if one of the eligible expenses, if one of the things that you need to deliver that programming is a capital project that is less than $20,000, that is something that you can apply for within the regular Community Gaming Grants Program. So that being said, this program that we're talking about today, the capital project sector, is for projects that are in excess of $20,000. So if you have a project in mind, a capital project in mind that is greater than $20,000, up to a limit of $1.25 million, then this is a program, the capital project program, that you may consider applying for. So as you can see, uh, $20,000 to $1.25 is the range of projects within which we would potentially fund. The maximum that we would fund for any particular uh, project through an application would be $250,000. So that's the maximum that you would receive in this program. Uh, we will also fund up to 50% of the total cost of the project. And this is very important. You're required to provide matching funds yourself. So if you have a project that's $100,000 in mind, then we could potentially fund 50,000 of it but you would need to provide 50,000 of your own. The more that you have uh, to contribute to the project, so you can certainly contribute more than 50%, the more that you have in hand above the 50%, the better that's actually gonna probably serve you in the end in terms of uh, the assessment process. 
Other things to note, uh, the application period for this grant program this year starts on June 1st, which is why we're in front of you today. Um, so June 1st is when the intake period opens, and we're going to take applications for this program up until the end of July. So you essentially have two months to get an application together for this program. Um, other points, one application per year. So you can submit uh, one grant application. If you have another project in mind, you'd have to hold off at least a year in order to submit that. And you're only going to get one grant per project. So that's just the basic overview of it. And again, you're going to find all this information uh, in the Capital Sector Project Guide. So I also mentioned at the beginning that this is a competitive process. So unlike the regular community gaming grants program, this is competitive. So what we mean by that is if you apply for the regular program, if you meet the basic uh, eligibility criteria, you're going to be guaranteed some degree of funding. Uh, but within this program, the Capital Project Sector Grant, meeting the basic mandatory eligibility is just the first step in the process. So you could get screened in. If you meet the mandatory eligibility, which is in Section 2 of our guide, you will be screened in. But then what will happen is uh, you're going to be um, moved on to the assessment round. And once you, meet the, once you make it into the assessment round, there's a series of criteria that we're going to apply to your, to your application which you'll find in sector four, uh, section four of our guide. And we're gonna go through and we're just gonna look at your application and see how well you meet each of those um, assessment criteria that are outlined in section four. And the higher you score, the more likely you are to potentially get a grant through this program. And once we've completed the ranking, so we're gonna rank all the ones that are screened in, um, there's gonna be some additional uh, considerations that are applied before the final decisions are made, and David's going to talk to you a little bit about that later in the presentation. So what I'd like to do at this point is just after having given you that, that basic uh, introduction, I'd just like to talk to you about the, the mandatory eligibility. So there's three things that you're going to need to keep in mind um, as you consider applying for this, for this program. So there's three eligibility requirements. The first of them is organization eligibility. Um, the second of them is project. And the third of them is financial. So I'm going to talk to you firstly about um, how you need to demonstrate that your organization is eligible. Straight out of the bat, um, if you've applied for the regular program before, you're going to see the, the criteria that are on the screen here in terms of eligibility are the same. If you have been uh, deemed as being eligible for a regular community gaming grants grant, the eligibility requirements in terms of your organization are the same for that program as they are for this. So what we're looking for in terms of eligibility is if you can demonstrate these things, you've met the first test of eligibility. So we're looking uh, through your application to make sure, first and foremost, that you're a not-for-profit organization and that you deliver programs that are primarily for the benefit of the community. We're also looking to make sure that the programming that you deliver falls within one of the six sectors, those being arts and culture, sport, environment, public safety, human and social services, or your parent advisory council or a district parent advisory council. So those are the sectors that we would potentially fund. We're also looking to make sure that the programs that you deliver benefit the community and not just the members uh, of your organization. And that the programs that you deliver are maintained and established by volunteers. Uh, carrying on with the organization eligibility, we're looking to make sure that your organization has a voluntary and a broadly based membership that's involved in the management and the operation of the organization. So this needs to be, uh, you're going to notice like volunteering is, is something that's very important to this program. So we need to see that evidence within your application. Uh, in terms of governance, your organization is going to need to provide us evidence that uh, the voting membership is at least double the number of board members. So you can't have an organization that has 30 members and 25 of them sit on the board. We need to see evidence that your uh, board is not only democratically elected, but it's being elected by a membership that is uh, far outweighs in terms of numbers, the number of people that actually serve on the board. So democratic and broadly chosen, and we're we're also looking for a uh, board composition where at least two-thirds of the people who serve on the board are residents of British Columbia. 
And the reasoning there is we want to make sure that the organization has, first and foremost, the interest of BC residents at heart. The final point you can see on the slide there is that uh, anybody who serves on your board must do so on a voluntary basis, so they cannot be financially remunerated uh, or receive any other financial benefit for work that they do on behalf of the board. So Stephanie's just going to very quickly, a little bit later, sort of um, point out some documents that you're going to need to provide as part of your application. And some of these, these documents you're going to provide are going to give us that evidence of the democratic collection of your board and the structure of the board itself so that we can determine that you've met uh, the criteria you can see there. So that's it for organization eligibility. So if you've met the requirements that uh, I've just mentioned on the slide in the previous slide, then you've met the organization eligibility requirements. So that's the first of the three tests of mandatory eligibility. The second is uh, the project itself. So the project, the capital project for which you're going to be applying for funds has to fall within one of three different categories. So we're going to fund projects that fall into either a facilities, a community infrastructure, or an acquisition category. So the first of them is facilities. So what we're looking for here is if you have a project, if you're considering constructing a new facility, let's say it's an office space or it's a daycare or something like that that fits into one of the six sectors we mentioned earlier, or it's something that you want to renovate or you need to maintain the existing facility that you, you're in that you run your programming out of, that is a facilities capital project which potentially could be funded. So it could be anything, like I said, from the construction of the new space, or it could be, say for example, you need to upgrade the HVAC system or the heating and the lighting, those types of things. Those are potentially eligible projects within the facilities. The second of those is a community infrastructure. If you have a project in mind that is a public amenity that will improve the quality of life for BC residents, that is potentially eligible. That could include things such as like a, a dock or a pier, um, a water park, a skate park, uh, an arena, any of those types of things that's a public facility that will benefit a broad community, that's potentially eligible as well. The third category is an acquisition. So what we would include in a category such as that is it, it's a privately owned asset. So it could be something like uh, you need to purchase a vehicle, you need to purchase a van to, to do your programming, or you need to do uh, some retrofitting on a, a an acquisition that you have like a van in order to deliver the programming, those types of things. It could also include um, uh, the purchase of property or the purchase of a building. Let's say there's a, a building that's available to you. So rather than building something new to deliver your programming, you can see a, uh, uh, another facility down the road. It's like, you know, that's actually would be a good space for us to do the programming. Could we potentially acquire or purchase this and get some funding support from you. Yes, that's potentially eligible as well. So those are the three categories. So facilities, community infrastructure, and acquisitions. So if the capital project you have in mind fits within one of those three broad categories, that's something that you uh, might consider this program as something that you want to apply for. What we're going to ask you to do, though, is quite often uh, a project might bleed into more than one of these. You need to pick the one project that best suits, or the one category, I should say, that best suits the project you have in mind. So pick the one of the three that uh, best matches your project. Okay, so that is project eligibility, or at least the first part of it. A couple other things to uh, be aware of in terms of the project itself. So in terms of both a facilities project and a community infrastructure project, these, uh, these uh, conditions apply. The project must be undertaken by an eligible organization for community benefit, uh, and it must be accessible and also inclusive to the public once the project is finished. So it needs to be something that everybody who wants to have access to it, uh, not everybody, but uh, the audience that you serve needs to have access to, to that facility or that community infrastructure project. And really important points here, and so I'm going to talk about this just for a little bit here. The other thing you're going to need to demonstrate to us in terms of documentation that you provide. So you're going to need to provide to us um, for facilities or community infrastructure projects, you're going to need to provide to us proof that one of three things, either that you own the land on which you're going to do the project, or that you lease the land, or that it's public land. 
So one of those three categories will apply. So if it is land that you own, when you submit your application to us, you're gonna to need to provide to us evidence that you actually own the land. So what we're gonna look for there is a, a copy of the title of certificate of the property so that we can, you know, we see evidence that you actually do own it. If it is land that you lease, what we're looking for is a minimum of a 10 year lease, uh, a signed agreement between you and your landlord, uh, proving that you actually um, have leased this property. If you have ten, less than 10 years left on the lease, what we're gonna ask you to do is provide us a letter that is signed by both you and the landlord, um, providing evidence that when the lease expires that you plan to renew it. Um, and the reason there I think you can probably understand is if we're gonna provide you a grant uh, for a capital project, we need to have proof and evidence that the facility or the community infrastructure, the space in which the project is gonna be completed, that you as the person on as the applicant, you're going to be the one not only developing the project, but you're going to be the one that's gonna to continue to deliver the programming in that space down the road. We don't want this project to all of a sudden um, disappear, go somewhere else, or somebody else is now under uh, managing that project. You're the name on file, so we wanna make sure that that continues. The third type is the public land. So if the space you have in mind for the project is on public land, it's neither land you own or that your landlord owns, um, that is still something that's potentially doable. What we'd be looking for there is um, approvals from any and all uh, organizations and responsible bodies for that public land that uh, give you permission to um, complete the capital project on that space. So as part of your application, we're gonna look for evidence that one of those three situations applies. So you're gonna to need to provide that documentation. So that's facilities and community infrastructure. Uh, the last points I wanted to make on project el eligibility has to do with the acquisitions. So the third category that we spoke of. So what you're gonna to need to demonstrate to us is that the acquisition, whatever it is you're going to acquire or purchase, is something that, um, is made by the eligible organization and it's primarily for the benefit of the community. And it's for the purchase of privately owned fixed capital asset for long-term use. And that the asset at the end of the day, it fully belongs to the organization itself. So that is project eligibility. And I'm going to turn it over now to David, who is going to speak to you about financial eligibility. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I think we're going to try and do a poll, though, first, right. if possible. Yeah. So, Susan, can you put up poll question number two for us, please? All right, we've got, uh, what dollar value of capital project are you interested in applying for? So if you could take a moment to give us this information, this helps us understand a little bit more about our the budget. Uh, now, while this is going on, I'm actually going to take this opportunity to ask a couple of questions that came up about the budget size before we go on too much further, um, because there's two really simple questions I wanted to get while we're getting these votes in, and then you can answer them and we can go on. Uh, a couple of people asked questions about project sizes where the the, uh, the expense of the project exceeded the 1.25 million. Uh, and I just wanted to ask on their behalf, does that make them not eligible to apply for these capital project grants? If it's in excess of 1.25? Yeah, if it's a total project cost. cost. Yes, does that make them ineligible yeah. to apply? Yeah, that's the range within which a project is eligible is 1.25, so that's the maximum. Okay, is that the maximum funding or or just the maximum no, project the ma size? That's, that's, that's the magic, uh, the magic. That's the, the maximum estimated project cost to complete the project in its entirety. Okay, and for capital projects yeah. that are less than 20,000, can they be included uh, in this or can they be included in the regular gaming grants stream? Yeah, that's included in the regular community gaming grants. So as I mentioned at the beginning, if you have a capital project that's gonna cost you less than 20, mm -hmm. and it's essential to the delivery of the program, then you can um, apply for funding for that within the application in the regular community gaming grant program. So this okay. program is anything that's above the 20 and less than 1.25 million. Okay, 
thank you. I see there's some more questions coming in about that, but we also have a fair number of our votes in and I want to move us along. So what I'll do is I will uh, read the rest of the questions and save them up for our next interlude. Uh, I'm going to close the poll now. Uh, you have about five seconds to vote if you haven't already voted. We're at 80% this time. So some people have stopped voting. That makes me so sad. All right, I'm going to close the Hopefully poll. Hopefully we didn't scare people away. <laughs> and I'm going to share the results of that poll so people can see the dollar value of capital projects that people are interested in applying for. We've got 466 attendees on the webinar right now, and 80% of them are voting. So this gives you an idea of the breakdown of capital project sizes that people have in mind for these grants. So 33% in the small one, 19% for 50 to 100,000, 11% at around 100 to 150, 8% at 150 to 200,000, and then it jumps back up to 30% for 200 to 250,000. So thank you very much everyone for uh, voting in that poll and we will carry on with the presentation. Thank you, Susan. And Moving on to financial eligibility. Great. So uh, now we're getting into the dollars and cents of the application. The applicant has to have a gaming account uh, set up at a financial institution before they can apply. And the reason for this is so that we have a place to deposit a successful grant application. In addition, uh, the applicant has to has the matching funds that equal or exceed that of the of the amount requested of the funding amount requested, and restricted funds that may have been designated in the past, for for example, a restricted roof replacement fund, those funds have to be included in the, the application as part of the matching requirement. Going further on, uh, we will accept tangible in-kind contributions. So those are things such as donated equipment or materials. However, uh, in-kind labor from volunteers will not be accepted at this time. If you are a past recipient of a gaming account, of a gaming grant, sorry, uh, your gaming account summary reports must be up to date. And this is to keep you eligible for this particular grant. Moving along on to uh, the assessment criteria that will be applied. So grant applications must meet all the eligibility criteria in order to move on. They'll be marked as against the specific assessment criteria that are following. Priority is going to be given to those projects that score highest in the four assessments categories. Now, the first category for 10% is alignment with sector objectives. The project here has to demonstrate community benefit and be responsive to the needs and issues of that community. The project must be accessible to the public and inclusive of the greater community. The second assessment category is project feasibility. This is worth 35% of the overall scoring. In this portion, we want to see evidence that your project is a viable project and can be completed successfully. You'll need to provide a detailed project timeline, including projected start dates, completion dates, any external factors that might affect your timeline, and dates for major milestones. Included with this is a risk management table. This will identify and rank potential risks to your project and the strategies that you have in place to meet those. And where it's applicable, all appropriate approvals and permits are required to be on hand, must be identified. The assessment criteria continues on. And the third category is financial considerations. This carries the most weight at 50% of your application total score. Here you need to demonstrate the financial resources required to complete the project have been secured. Funds and bank accounts, guaranteed loans, et cetera, et cetera. An applicant's matching funds contribution must equal or exceed the level of capital project grant funding requested. So if you need uh, 50,000 from us, uh, you must have at least 50,000, if not more, of your own funds secured. Lastly, the final 5% uh, 
goes towards special project features. This principally includes accessibility issues for persons with disabilities, or it can also include energy efficiency or other cost effective features of your project. Some additional considerations will be given to the distribution of the grants across the, all geographic regions of the province, over the six various sectors of the gaming grants, projects of various sizes and costs, and Indigenous not-for-profit organizations. There will be no reconsiderations, but feedback will be provided to assist organizations with future applications. If you have been unsu unsuccessful in your project application this year, you can reapply next year with the same application, uh, same project, should you wish. Supplementary documents. In addition to the organization's constitution and bylaws, you will need to have prepared uh, for inclusion in your application. Um, minutes from your most recent annual general meeting, project timelines. The project timeline will need to include things such as your project start date and completion dates, any dependencies, those, those are factors that might impact your timeline, dates for major milestones, and a risk management table. The risk management table will identify risks that are unique to your project and we would like to see how you plan on meeting those risks. In addition, you might require approvals or permits in order to complete your project. We would like to see evidence that those building permits, environmental assessments, and so forth have been obtained. If no permits or approvals are required, still use the text box to explain why this is, this is not applicable to your project. Long-term applications, well, sorry, long-term operations also include how do you plan on op operating, managing, and maintaining the project that you have funded. We'll need to see a project budget. This will include any accompanying notes to the budget and clearly identifies any assumptions you have made, projections, and or contingencies planned for. We would also like to see cost estimates or quotes. This will include one or more recent estimates for project expenses. Preferences will be given to those applicants who attach at least two quotes per item. If a sole source provider is, is the only available option, please explain why. And some other key points will include grants won't be awarded until, any until all the applications have been received and reviewed, and late or incomplete applications will not be accepted. And I noticed I missed a point. There will be no mail-ins of any information on this application. If possible, Susan, could you bring up poll question number three? Absolutely. Here we go. Poll question number three. This is actually a two-part question. So we're looking for, uh, I'm just assuming that I've got the right poll question here. We're looking to find out what sector your organization belongs to now. Uh, because the platform restricts us to having five available answers uh, per question, this is a two-part poll. So I'm going to ask what sector your organization belongs to. And if it's not one of these, wait for the next poll question. So on this one, we have arts and culture, sport, public safety, or something else. And if it is something else, you can just wait for the next poll question because there are more options coming up. Uh, on the next poll question, we'll have environment, human and social services, PACs and DPACs. Uh, one question that I'm going to ask, because I think it's a fairly easy answer, and a lot of people have been asking it, and I want to get it, get the answer to people before we go too much further. Many people have been asking, do the matching funds have to be in your bank account? Do they have to be confirmed and paid? Uh, in order to count as matching funds, or that can they be pending other funding sources? David, do you want to take that? Or? Sure. Uh, no, they don't have to be cash in, in hand in your bank account. However, the, of course, cash is always, uh, in my old accounting days, uh, cash is king. But you can have your other alternative sources of funds uh, lined up. 
but they do have to be lined up. You can't say, uh, I'm applying for the capital grant and I'm applying for these two other grants and don't know if I've got them yet. Correct. That you will not be ranked very highly at all. Okay. So it really, really matters to have those matching funds uh, committed and, and not, exactly. uh, not contingent. Yeah. yeah. We're looking for projects that will get started within 12 months of receiving a grant. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to close this poll here, and uh, I, I will share it, uh, the results of this, and then we'll move on to the next poll. So uh, bearing in mind that this is question one of a two-parter, here's our share, 22% arts and culture, 25% sport, 13% public safety, 40% something else, and they're waiting for the next poll question. So I'm going to get that going right now. Poll question number two is coming right up. So uh, if it wasn't mentioned in either poll, then you're not going to vote. We're not going to get high voter turnout on this because there's a whole bunch of you who, who don't have an option on this quick poll. But uh, many, many of you can. So I'm just going to wait a little while. I'm just looking for other, other easy questions off of my list. I've been grouping them together. And uh, trying to think of things that will have short answers. And here's a good short answer question. Uh, does putting in a new playground, uh, is it putting in a new playground at an elementary school, is that an acceptable project? So it's Mike here. I'll answer that question. Um, last year in this program, capital, uh, sorry, um, playgrounds were acceptable projects, but this year they're not. And the reason for that is uh, the Ministry of Education has announced this year a new playground equipment program. So it's a dedicated $5 million a year program through the Ministry of Education. So we've opted to remove that from ours and let the Ministry of Education take care of that one. So if there's any PACs or DPACs on the call who, who are interested potentially in um, a playground program, the best piece of advice is for you to contact your local school district because they'll have the information on the capital project for playgrounds. Great, thank you. All right, I'm gonna close and share the results from that last poll. So uh, further 8% uh, from environment organizations, 73% from human and social services, 9% from PACs and DPACs, 10% were not mentioned in either poll. There's other results from that. I will hide and you can carry on with your content. Okay. Hi, Susan. It's Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. It's Stephanie here. Can you just confirm that you're seeing my Google screen? We sure are. Perfect. Okay, so um, as mentioned earlier, my name is Stephanie Summers, and I'm going to be doing a live demo of the Capital Projects application. Um, I won't be going through every section in detail, but we will be going through the entire application process, so it should provide an understanding of how to do the application. Um, so the easiest way to get started on an application is to go to our website. If you don't know the website, if you go to Google and you type in Community Gaming Grant, an option already, it should be one of the first options and you can just click through on there. On our website, there are two places where you can get to the online service. So over here on the left side, right here where my mouse is hovering over, you can click online service over here. Or more prominently, there's a big box over on the right side. You can click in here and the button in the middle, it says online service. This is going to open up a new page that's not on our website. You will need to click this button in the middle, launch online service to get to it. So when we get there, we're gonna to come to a different website. And to before I get started, I want to make a couple of points that um, are important to remember. Um, before completing your application, your organization must be registered with our branch. So if you have previously applied for a community gaming grant or a gaming event license, or a gaming grant through direct access or bingo affiliation, you are most likely already in our system. If you're not sure or unable to find your organization, um, or if you're new, please call our office from
from Monday to Friday, and a grant analyst will register you into the system over the phone. And so the other thing that I want to get um, out of the way before we get started is, as mentioned earlier, it's mandatory that you have all of your documents ready to go and in the app and attached to the application. We're not accepting mailed in documents. So you want to have your documents prepared and ready to go for easy access when you're navigating through the system. Um, and with the attachments, there are uh, the acceptable forms of attachments are JPEGs, Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, and PDFs. There's no limit to the number of documents that you can attach in any section. However, there are maximum sizes for each attachment. Uh, so each attachment can be a maximum of 10 megabytes. And for the entire application, it is 40 megabytes. So please be mindful of that. So let's get started now with the application. So again, there are two places on the screen that you can apply. So over here on the left, again, there's an apply online button here. Or if you prefer to look at text down here in the middle, there's also an apply button right there. So we're going to click through and it's going to open up a search screen. And this is where you will look for your, for your organization. If you know your LNG file number, you can type it in here. If you do not know your LNG file number, you can search for your organization. And when you click the next button, you're going to get a search result. Make sure that this is your organization that you are selecting. Once you've confirmed it, you click, you click this select button right here. It's going to open up this organizational screen. It's important to note that this part of the application will show twice. Anything that you input in here, please make sure you put in both boxes. So when you're scrolling down, it's going to have the information about your mailing address, your BC Society's number if you have one, your fiscal year end, when your organization started operating. If you've applied for it before, you'll see a bunch of programs and services. Down here on the bottom, if there's any information that's incorrect, please type here so that we know what needs to be fixed. And again, like I said, this will come up again. Please make sure you input in both boxes to make sure we get the information. Once you're sure, it's going to be a next button down on the right corner. You're going to click this one right here. And it's going to open up a new screen. And you're going to select the application type where you have two options. You're going to want to select grant. You're not going to want to select license. So again, click the grant button. And again, the next button on the bottom right side. You click forward. It's going to open up the different types of grants. It's very important that you select the capital project grant. Um, this is so that when the application comes in, we know that it's a capital project grant. If you click one of the other ones, it will end up in another queue and it will not open the correct application form. So make sure you click capital project grant and click next to continue on to the next screen. And now we have opened up the application. So as I mentioned earlier, the organizational information is here again. It's just a repeat of before, any changes, type in this box right here. And then you continue down. If there's any supporting documentation, such as you changed your fiscal year end, you can attach the file. Uh, I won't be attaching here because I will cover that later. Um, so as you make your way through the application, and we scroll down, you'll notice that there are red asterisks in some sections. These are mandatory fields. If you do not fill them in, an error message will come up, and I will intentionally leave one blank so that we can see that come up. So again, as we asked earlier, um, you need to identify the sector in which you belong. Um, if you're not entirely sure, you can take a look at your uh, constitution and just find the one that best fits with your organization. Um, for this one, we'll just select arts and culture. And again, the subsector over here, you just, again, select the one that fits for you. 
your at, is your organization an Aboriginal not for profit? Again, you just select yes or no. And then we move down into the supporting documentation that was talked about earlier. So I'm not going to go into details about the types of stuff that is required, but I am going to say for the Constitution and Bylaws, if your organization has uh, submitted a copy of your most recent Constitution and Bylaws within the last two years, you do not need to attach them here. If you have not, please do attach them here. If the Constitution and Bylaws are in two separate documents, you can attach both documents here. So then we move down, and it goes into the membership and governance structure. So you put in the number of people that are eligible to vote at the annual general meeting. This includes your directors. So if you have 20 people, including your directors, that's what you put in. If you've got six board members, that's what you put there. And then you continue through. So as uh, the board of directors list is a required document, so we will choose the file. It'll come up. I've got everything on the desktop here. And then you just select the appropriate. And then you click the add button. It's there. And you make your way down. Same thing. You need to do your annual general meeting if you click into the calendar. Usually a calendar pops up here. Okay, here. You can type it in as well. There you go. Uh, there is usually a calendar, so if you wanted to toggle through, you can. And this is where you let us know how many people attended your annual general meeting. And then you choose your minutes and you attach them. And you continue through and you attach and add. For the gaming account, um, here, as mentioned, you do need to have a dedicated bank account um, called the gaming account. Uh, if you are a previous client and we have your gaming account on file and there's no change, you do not need to submit a void check. If you're an existing organization and there have been changes, or if you're a new organization, please choose the file here and attach it, just like we've done in the other one. You scroll down further, you get your project name, you put it in, choose the type from one of the three categories that were mentioned before. For the purposes of this, I'm going to choose an acquisition. And then when you get to the project description, um, you can type in this field. Um, please be aware that there is a character limit on this field and it is 4,000. Um, the other thing to note is if you're going to be copying and pasting this from another document, it may be in your best interest to just choose the file and attach it so that um, there, you know, so that you don't necessarily copy too many characters and it doesn't all come in or sometimes um, the system does funny things when you copy and paste and it doesn't come through with all the information. Um, as this text box is a mandatory field, if you're going to attach, just type in the attached. And this is the same for all of these sections here, so for community benefit as well as public inclusiveness, and you could attach a file here. And as we move down, the project feasibility is the next piece. This is where you're going to put the timeline which you have ready. You need to attach a file, click it, add, and again, if you would like, you need to put in the start dates again not coming in, but they've got the date format there. So if it was starting on June 1st, put that there. Oh, I put the wrong date, that's okay. And I put it in. One, seven. And you put that in. Short project. 
And then you would use your risk management. Attach the appropriate document. Now you come to the appropriate approvals, and this is where um, if you have anything, any approvals, you can list them in here. You can attach the files. If you don't have any approvals, this is where you would write in why there are no approvals necessary. Let the branch know. And again, with the ongoing long-term viability, type it in or you can attach a file here. And you scroll down again and the financial considerations, we're gonna put in a project cost of 100,000 to be simple. And then you can choose a file again here. Now I'm going to not hit the add button just to show you um, this is going to be my error here. So I have forgot to attach this. I have I've clicked it open, I've selected it, but I mistakenly forgot to hit add and I just continued down on my way. Here's cost estimate. Add that one. Now I've requested a $100,000 grant and I'm going to put it in here. It's important when you're putting in your figures, you don't need to put the dollar sign. It already shows up. Do not put commas in, just simply the amount. Again, catch. And then we get down to the matching funds. So this is where you're going to let us know whether or not you have matching funds and where they're coming from. So for this example, let's say that I have 50,000 in restricted funds. It's confirmed it's in my bank. I'm gonna write restricted funds and it's 50,000. Now say I only had 25,000 here and I was getting 25,000 from a community partner and it's been promised. I just click this new row here and then I can continue on and write it in. Now, let's say I click this in error by accident, you just simply hit the delete button, but we can't have any empty rows, so just ensure that each row is complete and completed in its entirety. And if it's not confirmed, you will see that there's also uh, an option to let us know that as well. So moving down to the state of title or license to occupy, so this is the um, we need to provide the address. You need to put in more details with the province and postal code, but for this purposes, we'll just do that. And then you're gonna to need to select where the project is located. Is it land that's leased to you, public land, as was already talked about earlier? I'm gonna select not applicable for this um, purpose, but if, you, if it's not, and you do have something, and you're not sure what document you need to attach, there's this note right here. It will explain to you what you need for each section. Um, so take a look at that. If you're not sure, get it together and attach it there. And if you scroll down, the next section is where you can tell us about um, the special project features such as the accessibility and the energy efficiency as was uh, previously talked about as well. And then down at the very end, the last piece here is the additional information. So if there's something that is relevant to your application that you feel doesn't fit in one of the categories above, you can attach the document here. Um, we do want to see it um, as something that's relevant to the project itself. Um, we don't need to have um, other information that's not relevant to the project. If your gaming account summary report is due, you can attach that here in this section as well. And then we get to the end of the application, which is the submission information. Um, so if you're familiar with our regular application, it's the same requirements. We require two board members um, to act as officers responsible for the application. There needs to be one person designated as the submitter and one is the contact person. One person can fill more than one role, so you don't need to have um, four different people, but 
but the important thing is that you do need to have two board members um, as officers responsible. So then you would just click through here and you would put their name and you can just and then you say officer one. Now if this person is also the submitter, you could click the submit button. So what you've now seen up here too is this little green check mark says, yes, we have a submitter here. So this is going to be your um your way of checking to make sure that you have everything needed before you try to go through. Again, we need an address. We need a city. We need your postal code. We need a phone number. And an email address would be good as well. And then you follow through again with the same one. We've got another director here. This is your second officer responsible. This person is also going to serve as your contact. Now you can see that all three green buttons have checked. You've, you've completed the requirements. So, Again, I'm going to leave one of these empty so we can see. Phone number is required. Email. You can leave the additional field blank. If one of these people was not your submitter or contact, you can add a third person or a fourth person down here as well. I'm going to leave it blank. And then you get to the bottom of your application and you need to select an email that the is going to come up. So we're going to go your email address. And it's very important that you just put one email address in here. Um, as the system will, you will be notified through the system and it's going to pull from this address. If you put in more than one address, it's very likely that you will not get your notification email. So once you're sure that you've got everything done, you click the next button. As you can see, there were a couple of errors. So what, take a look so we can say, could not save my changes. So let's scroll down and see what I did incorrectly. What did I forget? So you scroll down, there will be a warning. So it should be fairly clear once we get to it. Where? Here it is, it's in red. I need at least one project button. Oh no, I forgot to hit the add button. Let's get that in there. There we go, it's in. Oh, we also made an error down here. It will let you know of each one. Oh no, we didn't provide a phone number for this person or a city. Oh, because so because it didn't have an area code as well, it also knew it was invalid. Okay, all of the red ones are now open. We filled them out. Now we're going to click the next button again. You're going to come up with the terms and conditions. You read through them. You agree to them. Click this button right here. This is mandatory to move forward. And then there's a large submit button at the bottom. Click submit. This is opening up a new, this is your confirmation page. Um, this is your only opportunity to open up the application summary. Click that open. Here is a copy of your application. Save it to your computer, print it, whatever you need to do. Um, but this is your one and only opportunity to have that. It's going to have your application ID on that. Um, it's it's probably important that so, you. So Stephanie, connect. you think that people really should make a copy of that somewhere? I think that it should. If you if you're going to be, especially if you're going to be contacting the branch um, about it, um, mm -hmm. and you know if you want to make sure um, that you know it'll. Come down here, you can see, here's the attachment. So you can see what attachments you attached. Okay. 
Um, and so this is this is your one and only chance to do that. And that is the end of the application. And now I'm going to take a look at the um, the website for you. Okay, so if we go back. Gaming grant. So we'll come back to our website. So probably not the easiest way to get through to the system, um, but since we had gone through, that's where it ended up. Um, and so when you're in our main site um, and the community gaming grants, if we go back to the left menu here, you'll see a number of different options. So there is an entire page over here on the left side, right here, the third one down, that's dedicated to information about the capital project grant. So if you click over to that, it'll open up a new page. This is where you're going to find a copy of the Capital Project Sector Guide that was mentioned earlier. It's highly recommended you take a look through this guide before your application to get a full understanding of the eligibility criteria and uh, required documentation. More information is provided in this table, including the sections for some of these for easy reference. And if you make your way through down to the bottom of here, there's also resources that you may find helpful for your application. So if you click this down arrow. Sorry, Stephanie, just one thing before yeah. you go on. So folks, you can see where it says the Capital Project Sector webinar section there. Those of you who um, would like to, you know, play back this uh, recording later, that's where we're going to post a copy of this webinar once it's complete. Okay. Um, so that's where that's going to go. And so the resources that you might find helpful, if you open up this drop down here, you'll see a number of example documents. So uh, there's a pre-application checklist. This is a great tool to use um, to make sure that you are prepared and have all the documentation ready to go for your application. If you have this up on your computer, you print it off, you can tick off that you have all the items and you can know that you're prepared. Underneath is the application tutorial. So it is a document that basically covers what I just showed you on the live demo. So if you need to reference back to some of the items, this should show you where uh, what you need to do. Frequently asked questions, some example documents of the financial information, another copy, another link to the sector guide if you've made your way down here and you don't want to scroll up and then old documentation from our previous, from last year, and our contact information down on the bottom if you need to contact the branch. And I think that's it for me. Susan, are you able to queue up our next poll question, please? Yeah, absolutely. Here we go. Question is, is your organization a previous applicant to, uh, this is gaming grants or licensing? I have lots of questions coming in. Oh my goodness, this is a very engaged and question asking group of people. So take a few minutes here to just answer our last poll question. We've got uh, we got seventy percent voter turnout. We have it, it's it's a long webinar, but the, the a good webinar and the the, uh, the questions will be answered coming up. So hopefully you guys can stick in there. And uh, you can you can go for lunch afterwards. We have 78% voter turnout, so I'm going to close the poll now so we can move on. Nine, uh, here we go. Sharing. 90% of the attendees on today's webinar, their organization is a previous applicant to grants or licensing. So we have an experienced bunch of people here. I'm going to hide that and, and take it away, Stephanie. Well, actually, it's going to be David. Oh, David. And I'd like to thank Stephanie for that great uh, run through on the online gaming application system. So we're going to hit the, we're nearing the end of the presentation itself before we'll get to questions. And we're, we're hitting the accountability section of uh, this presentation. So what will be, uh, the accountability refers to those organizations that will receive a gaming grant, a uh, capital project gaming grant and uh, the responsibilities that uh, are going to come along with that grant funds. 
So uh, organizations, once they receive the funds, will have to spend the funds according to uh, the guidelines on eligible expenses. And those can include things such as uh, project-related fees for professionals, and that could be architects, consultants, and so forth. Uh, buying the materials if you need them for a, a, a facilities project. Uh, transportation and shipping costs also qualify as eligible costs. Um, any costs for fees, uh, sorry, licenses or permits, those are all eligible items. Yeah, if for some reason you need an environmental impact assessment, that's also an eligible item. So anything that is direct and necessary uh, towards the completion of your project is an eligible cost. Now, upon receiving those community uh, that capital grant, uh, you have to start your project within 12 months of the receipt date. And you also have 36 months from the date of receipt to complete your project. All of that will have been explained in your overall application, but your gaming account summary report, which will be due 90 days after your fiscal year end, will also monitor the progress of your project. If for some reason uh, your project is going to deviate from what you submitted, you must obtain written permission from the branch to deviate from your project that you submitted. So no substantial changes will be entertained without the direct approve, um, uh, approved uh, document from the branch. Uh, with your gaming account summary report, which you'll get a separate copy from the branch on, you'll detail how your expenditures were made and uh, how that occurred over the period of the year. And the expenses will be analyzed and, and uh, reviewed against the uh, approved grant application that you need. And that'll be the end of my section. So, Mike? Yeah. Well, folks, we just, we've taken you through the entire uh, process from start to completion in terms of the capital project sector grant. So, uh, a lot of information, and it sounds like, Susan, there's a lot of questions as well. So, we're, we're happy to uh, pass it over to you if you want to uh, facilitate that process, and uh, we, we're happy to answer any questions that people may have at this point. Okay, thanks, Mike. I, I haven't actually been able to even categorize all of the questions that came sure. in. Uh, I've got up to questions asked at 10.57 a.m., but I'm going to keep going. And we have, there's a fair number of, of people who've asked the same questions. So what I'm going to do is actually begin with some of the topics that were brought up at the beginning of the webinar, and I'll, I'll work through those. I want to let everyone know that if we don't get to asking your question or answering it as is part of the webinar. Uh, all of the questions are being recorded and uh, the team here will go through them and make sure that uh, if, if there's things that didn't get mentioned in this webinar or in this recording, they'll follow up with you. A lot of people have some very specific questions about can this be eligible, can this be eligible, uh, and if we have time I'll, I'll get to those, but I also think that that uh, because some of them are very individual and unique, um, I'm going to try to ask some of the questions that seem to be uh, sort of more commonly uh, asked. So uh, one of the questions, and I'm going to go back to matching funds. A very uh, popular question was, does it matter where the matching com funds come from? Can they be other grants, other government money, private sector contributions? Uh, are there any restrictions on those? Well, one restriction would be it has to be legal, obviously. <laughs> um, but Get out no, of it's, town. it's quite broad. <laughs> Have to put that out there. Um, it's quite broad in terms of where where the funding can come from. But David did mention earlier that cash is king. So, uh, in terms of the matching funds, you have to provide at least fifty percent, and certainly the more you can provide above the fifty percent, the better that's going to position you in terms of the assessment phase. So uh, it can come from a variety of sources. It can come from, uh, you know, if you, I think we mentioned, if you have restricted funds set aside, let, let's say your project is to uh, repair the roof of your building and you've been restricting funds over the, the last few years uh, with the eye towards fixing that, that roof down the road and then you apply to us and get matching funds, your matching funds would need to, first and foremost, they would need to start with the funds that you've restricted. So if you're looking for funds from us to repair your roof, 
money that you've set aside already towards the repair of that roof, you're going to need to to, to ante that up. Uh, fundraising, different different uh, opportunities there. Whatever the project is, you can fundraise within your community. Um, you can receive local or other provincial or federal grants. That's all good. But again, the bottom line is you're going to be better positioned if it's funds that you already have in hand. So if you come to us and say, you know, if you provide us, you know, we're looking for fifty thousand dollars, and and if you can kick in fifty thousand, then this other uh, funder uh, said that they will kick in fifty. You know, that's that's potentially doable, but uh, if it's already committed, then that's actually going to position you better. Okay. Any more you want to add to that? No, um, it, the funds can come from any source, and uh, if you already have them in, in hand, uh, that can be applied against your your uh, your request. Great. Uh, so a, a somewhat similar or, or aligned question is uh, when considering in-kind contributions, uh, can professional services that are donated, so an electrician donating their time, can that be considered as in kind, as in kind at uh, the applicable market rate for that professional service? I think that's actually one of the questions we have in the FAQs, actually. But the bottom line with in kind is like this is the this is a very tangible grant program, right? Like we're we're looking for things that are actually built or things that are purchased where you can actually see a tangible thing at the end of it. So in terms of in kind, it's the same sort of same sort of thinking. What is eligible for in kind is something that is tangible that can be contributed to the completion of the project. So a good example would be like if you're going to build a I don't know, like a, a clubhouse for whatever your programming is that you, you deliver. If Home Depot comes along and says, we're willing to donate a pallet of lumber, that is a tangible in-kind contribution that you can put some monetary value on. That is something that we would accept as an in-kind contribution. Uh, in-kind uh, donations of uh, time and equipment, those types of things, it's, it's less so. David, what do you want to add to that? Well, uh, the wiring, for example, that the electrician would provide, uh, that would be your tangible in-kind um, contribution. So again, it is very much aimed at being a uh, tangible process uh, program where we really want to see uh, physical things that are being uh, matched towards the project. So it, it wouldn't, so the person who's donating their time, it wouldn't be eligible as part of the matching funds. But we would want to see demonstra a demonstration of that uh, uh, donation in terms of, you know, it needs to be a line item within the project budget itself. Okay. And I think if people have more questions about that, they can probably follow up with you guys in the branch because they may have yeah. some specific individualized uh, individual yeah. situations. Okay, great. Um, yeah. I'm going to move down now. Um, so if project, there's there's some questions about if project costs are uh, say 30,000 of the total project costs. And so 50% of that is only 15,000. Does that make the project ineligible? So does the total no. project cost, so the total project can, can be 20,000 and then you're making a $10,000 request and that's okay. That's fine. So just okay. the bottom line is the project must be a minimum of $20,000. Okay. And so we would, we would fund up to 50% of that. So if the project was 30, we would fund up to a maximum of 15. It may be less, it may be 15. Okay. So whatever we don't fund, the organization needs to, well, it needs to cover their half and anything beyond that is up to them. Okay. Um, can several small capital projects be added together to come up with that 20,000 cost? The short answer is no. So we're looking for discrete projects that will be funded. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on, a uh, question about the timelines for your process. Are grants being looked at as they're received or does everything get adjudic adjudicated and reviewed after the closing date? The latter. So, you know, you, you have up until the end of July to submit an application and we will not be looking at any of the applications until they've all been received okay. until the sector closes. So that's different than it is for the regular community game grant program where um, as the applications come in and as uh, there's time available within the analyst pool, the applications are looked at, but this, we're not looking at any until they're all received and the sector's closed. 
Are you looking at them in order that they were received? So we'll, so we'll, all, we'll all getting the, it in early get you an earlier yes or no? No, no. Your, your application may start to be reviewed um, with the resources that we have on hand, and, but no assessments will be made until every project has been received and reviewed. And at that point, they'll all be ranked and assessed against the criteria that we covered off in today's presentation. So okay. you don't want to submit, if everyone submits on the last day, the system will probably crash and you probably <laughs> won't get your application. In. So it is open for roughly 60 days. You want to get your application in calmly without any stress. And you know that uh, it'll, everything will have been submitted because you'll have printed off your, your confirmation sheets at the end. And then you can just relax knowing that the decisions will be made by the deadline of October 31st. Okay. Thank you. Um, so with project timelines, uh, well, first I want to ask two more questions about this overall thing. Um, what is the total amount of funding that will be uh, awarded? What is the pool size this year? The current pool is $5 million. Okay. All right. I'm moving down my list here. Um, will Do you anticipate running this every year? And so if people aren't ready this year, can they apply? Can they just plan to apply next year? We Well, this is the second year of this, and we have commitment for this year and also for next year. We're hopeful that it will continue beyond that. Okay. So, nope. if an, yeah, to answer the question, if an organization is unsuccessful, it's not the end of the line. They can certainly uh, take a look at the feedback they're going to receive and, you know, adjust accordingly and resubmit for next year. Okay. What if they started the project? didn't get their funding, but they were going ahead with the project anyway. Can they apply next year for a project that's in progress? You can apply for a project that's in progress. You certainly can't apply for one that's completed um, because that would essentially be a rebate. You can't you can't bank on this funding obviously coming through at all. Right. So any, any organization that starts a project and then applies to this has to come into this with their eyes wide open and realize that they may get it or they may not. So um, it's possible. Okay. Do you want to add to that? Uh, the, the original rollout of this capital uh, grant was for three years, and, and as Mike mentioned, we're in year two. Uh, after year three, we don't know what the government will decide to do at that point. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to turn to the question of uh, volunteers, and there was a number of questions here. I'm going to sort of try to sum up or, or uh, cross-reference them. Um, what does it mean when you say maintained and established by volunteers? And the project needs to be established or maintained by volunteers. Can you talk more about that? Uh, it's essentially that the, that the organization applying um, is made up of a volunteer or is made up of volunteers. So people who you know, have a deep passion for whatever it is that that organization does, Meals on Wheels, um, you know, uh, environmental parks, something of that nature, that they're involved in the organization as members, as board members, and even in perhaps the maintenance or, or operations of the capital project for which they apply. But of course, there are unique projects, so we can't say for sure for every example, but really we want to see active memberships, and that can be demonstrated um, by the applicant in their, in their descriptions. Okay, so does paid staff running a program disqualify the organization from the grant? No, it does not, and it can be an eligible cost. Okay. Um, all right, I'll just scan through the fees. Um, so just to, just to follow up on that, Susan, like we we're saying, you know, primarily maintained and delivered by, that that's certainly doesn't mean that your organization can't have paid employees. So for a daycare, for example, it's, it's, it's rare to have uh, full-time daycare staff that are volunteers. Generally speaking, we like to have professionals looking after our children. Um, but if there's yeah. a volunteer board and professional staff, that's, that's eligibility? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and can the board be a school district board or a PAC exec? School districts would be ineligible to apply either for this program or a regular community gaming grant program. They're not okay. eligible at all. Okay, but PAC execs can. PACs can, okay. uh, just yeah. just to 
circle back on what we mentioned earlier, the, the only uh, exception for PACs and DPACs now is, is playgrounds. So if right. they have a project in mind besides a playground, it's potentially eligible. Okay, um, on that topic, uh, for playgrounds, some organizations that aren't PACs, so they're not school-related organizations, uh, they might be um, other community daycare facilities or community groups. If they're looking at playgrounds, is that an eligible capital expense for a non-school-related group? Yep. If you're to look, at, actually, if you're to look at the cover of our sector guide, there's actually a picture of kids playing basketball in the playground. Right. So what we're what we're basically saying here is what is ineligible is a playground on public school property. If it is a playground on, you know, just somewhere in the general public beyond a school property, that is a potentially fundable project because that would be a community infrastructure project. OK, great. A um, couple more things about organizations. If a board member is contracted to do work for the organization separate from their board duties, does this disqualify the organization from applying for capital grants or regular grants? No, it does not disqualify them. So board members may have other duties within the organization unrelated to the board, and for, and for those duties, they could be paid. Okay. Um, it's if, just the specific board duties that they can't they can't use funding towards. Ah, gotcha. Cannot be remunerated for. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, if an organization has programming in more than one area, can each area apply for a capital grant? So if there's a social service organization that has arts programming and has a capital project for their arts programming, can they apply for that and perhaps also something for their social service programming? So an organization can submit one capital project grant per year. So they can't submit more than one. So if they offer multiple types of programming and they're looking for uh, a capital grant contribution to each of those, the answer would be no. But the other thing too to mention, I don't know if we did mention it earlier, is you can actually apply for funding through both the community gaming grant program and also the capital sector project grant. So uh, applying for one doesn't exclude you from applying for the other. Okay, if great. That helps answer your question. That does help, and that was my next question, and you just answered it, so that's fabulous. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna. I have a number of of specific project questions, but I'm actually going to skip through those and ask about community benefit. Is there a definition of what constitutes benefiting the broader community? There, well, there is sort of. I guess the the best place for an organization to look, and well, 90% of them, if I heard your stats right, like 90% of the people are um, experienced with their regular community gaming grant program. So what I'm going to suggest you do is look back through the um, community gaming grants guidelines for the main program, and I think it's section three talks about uh, talks about the six sectors, and it actually talks about how depending on which sector you're in, how you can demonstrate your community benefit. So if your arts and culture, it provides examples of what we're looking for in terms of community benefit, environment, PACs, whatever. So that's your best sources to look back at that uh, um, document. So whatever the benefit is for that program would be similar to this. Okay, and if someone's acquiring real property, so a, a, a clubhouse or a facility that's going to be used by the members of the club or the clients of a program, um, how do you define, you know, what inclusiveness looks like if a specific sector, perhaps a, a specific vulnerable uh, demographic sector, is, are the ones using that facility? Does that count as inclusiveness? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, but for example, if, if it, let's say it is a building um, and it's aimed at a particular uh, disadvantaged group, you know, certainly that is the program that the, the organization was is running and that's their target audience, but uh, they would enhance their application by saying, when not in use, we rent out the space at below market rates to the general community. So now you can see how they're broadening the exposure of that facility, that building to the broader community. And so there's multiple uses happening with that asset. Okay, so some of the projects that people have brought up are things like, um, seniors shelters or um, facilities for uh, people with accessibility needs, where the general public eh, probably isn't necessarily going to come and use that space because it's purpose built for particular needs. Um, is that a drawback for community benefit? Well, I think this sort of ties back into the question around community. So 
the community for a particular project may be different from a community for a different project. So to, to think about your example of the seniors facility, the community that would use that, when we're talking about accessibility and inclusiveness, it's anybody and everybody who would have a use for that facility and that project in question. So it might not be something that is suitable or of interest to a broad community, but it's something that is of interest and potential use and should be accessible to that community of seniors. So ah. that's where the definition of community varies from project to project and sector to sector, to be honest. Okay. So we don't expect it to necessarily be open to everybody and everybody. It just needs to be open and accessible to those who could potentially be in that audience. Okay. Agree with that? Yep. For whom it would be of use. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Alrighty, moving on. A um, couple of questions about project timelines. You've answered a couple of them. How long does the applicant have to use the funds? Three years. So the, the project must be started within 12 months of the receipt of the funding, uh -huh. and it must be completed within three years of that point. Uh, unless, you know, you need to, if there's something that, um, you know, has come up, you know, contact the branch and uh, we'll have a conversation about that. And potentially, you know, that timeline may be extended. But, um, you know, what we're looking for in terms of the application itself is when you do that timeline, we're looking to make sure that you've thought through all the possibilities and the variables and have foreseen any potential, you know, things that may slow down or derail the project to begin with. Okay. Um, are there, here's a couple of questions about applications. Are there sample project timelines available? No, there, no. there aren't any. No. Um, and again, because it can, the, the, the breadth of applications and types of projects that the organizations out there may have in mind, um, they'll have to determine what works best in their situation. There's plenty of resources on the web and uh, they can also seek uh, advice from other organizations or professionals that might be able to give them some pointers for their particular project. But it, it doesn't need to be an esoteric um, a document. It could be a simple uh, straight line timeline saying, you know, here's the date we get the funds, here's the expected date to make the purchase, and here's the closing date on that particular project. It, it, so it doesn't need to be very fancy if your project is not a complicated one. Okay, uh, that was timeline. Now the other question is about risk management documents. Do you have any samples of a risk management document or can you explain a bit more about what a risk management document is, please? I'll take that one. So just like David said, it's the same thing. Like, um, you know, use your, your best judgment on what you think that should be. Essentially what we're looking for, again, it's just an assurance that you've thought through anything that could potentially have an implication for the completion of your project in the timeline or at all. So well, the way I would approach it just in general is just uh, could be something as simple as a table where, you know, in one column you list the potential risks to this project and then in another, so each of them you list separately and then the next column could be, uh, you know, the likelihood of that occurring, you know, low, medium, high, and the last column could just be something as simple as what is your strategy to 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 address that uh, risk should it occur. So essentially, we're just looking for just something as simple as that that you've thought through all the possibilities, and you know we can look through that and say, okay, well, if this did happen, how would we possibly respond to it? So I wouldn't I wouldn't be much more I wouldn't put much more thought into it than that. I don't think just as long as you clearly articulated it and thought through a strategy for how to deal with it should it occur, which hopefully it won't. Okay, yeah, hopefully we don't have any of those things happening. Yeah. Um, right. Thank you. Um, is So is there, there a requirement for a separate gaming account, uh, separate from the one that you use for your regular community grants? Do you need to open a separate capital gaming account? Uh, you can use the same gaming account that you use for your regular application. Um, that's totally fine. Um, it's just if you have not been a client of ours before and you do not have a gaming account, you would need to open a separate account for your gaming, for this um, gaming money. Okay, but you can use the one you guys already have on file. And 90% yes, if there's already a gaming account, it can be used for this. Excellent. Um, all right, how does one find out whether an organization is up to date with their reporting? 
this is relevant because I know boards of directors have turnover and grants in the past are not always known to the boards of the future. So the very best place to start is the, or, the, the, the new board, if, if we're going that route, should have a look at the last notification letter that they've received from the branch. And uh, if they're behind in their gaming account summary reports, it will be stated in that letter. Second best place is then to contact the branch either by phone or by email and make a request. The request has to come in through uh, an approved person from the organization. Okay, and who does that approved I, person I just have put to the, be? I just put the contact information on the screen there in case anybody wants to jot that down now. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, who who do those uh, those approved people? Who do they have to be? Uh, it's usually uh, so it would be a board member or if there is a contact person on the application, um, either your capital or your community gaming grants um, application. So if there's a contact person uh, listed on there that's not a board member, that would be authorized or a board member. Okay, so it sounds like it's something that the organization decides who's gonna be the appointed person to deal with the, the gaming grants. Be that a, a particular uh, staff person yeah, or a board member. Person. Okay. But there, there needs to be the two directors uh, mentioned in the gaming online application system. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, someone was wondering about the uh, the, the no mail-in of applications. So, uh, just to confirm, all application material has to be submitted through the online application form and not mailed in separately to the uh, gaming grant branch after the fact, because you can do that sometimes Correct. with community gaming grants. Yeah, well, and again, this is a different process, right? This is a competitive process, this grant program. So the expectation is if everybody um, has to put in all their, their information in the same way and is it assessed according to common criteria, then the expectation as well is that everybody needs to submit everything together at the same time. Okay, great. Um, now, just looking at the application process, does the online form allow you to save your process or do you have to do it in one go? You have to do it in one go. Okay. There is no save function. And, and there is a timeout function. So don't leave your uh, open application uh, for too long, otherwise you might come back and find that it's it's closed on you. Or don't spend an hour typing in a, one of those text boxes, um, typing out your project description. If it's going to take you an hour to type it out, type it in a Word document and attach it. Yeah. So uh, Stephanie did mention to you earlier that in terms of resources on our website, there's a pre-application tutorial. Go through that before you even sit down to start obviously doing the application because it's going to walk you through all the things that you need to have organized and prepared so if you do that kind of stuff when you get to the application process itself it shouldn't take you very long at all uh, the other thing that i just quickly needed to mention in terms of time is i just got a notification on my computer that the battery is about <laughs> to expire so Saw that. my presentation goes dark you know why the battery's running down well yeah, if, if the presentation goes dark you'll go dark but don't worry everybody i'll still be here <laughs> All right. <laughs> it won't crash. It's just Mike will go away. Um, Mike will oh, go away. Uh, should, oh, is there um, uh, character or word limits uh, on the application? And do they show as you're, as you're putting them in? So you can avoid um, that awful, oh, my God, I have to take 50 words out of my perfectly crafted description? Uh, there is a 4,000 uh, character limit on the text boxes. Um, I do not believe that there is um, a, a number that shows up on the bottom, but it will not allow you to type further than 4,000. So if you hit that 4,000 character limit, you're not going to be able to type any further. All right. And commence. So, and if you, again, if you think you're going to be close to that 4,000 character limit, it's probably easier and faster just to attach the document. Ah, and so there's no limit if you attach the document, but there is if you try to type it in. Yes. But, uh, there is a data size limit with yes. the file. All right. Are you guys going to stop reading a Word document when it hits 4,000 words? 
Are you going to no. read the whole thing? <laughs> <laughs> but to our potential applicants out there, you want to make sure that what you write is, is relevant to your project. All right. This is a competitive process. Conciseness counts. It, it, it's, we're going to have a lot of applications, um, so you want to keep on target, focused with your application requirement. Okay. Uh, here's an interesting question. If you have a community service cooperative number instead of a society number, where would you enter it? Uh, you could just provide that in the organizational changes um, text boxes that were shown at the um, both the one screen and then at the very beginning of the application. Um, you could just type it in there. Okay. Um, great. Thank you. Last year, this grant program had problems accepting applications from Mac computers. Has this issue been resolved for this year? Uh, there, there aren't supposed to be any issues between uh, the various platforms out there. Um, and having said that, we do, we do hear on occasion that Mac users have some problems. We, what we recommend is that you try various uh, uh, browsers. So you could use your Safari browser your, or switch over to a Google Chrome browser or even an Internet Explorer browser is, is your best options to get going, uh, your probably the most important thing is, I really would recommend that you don't submit an application at the last minute. Uh, your anxiety levels will be high, and there'll be lots of other applications coming in as well. So uh, that will be your best bet, is not to leave it to the last minute. And if you are having recurring problems, you can contact the branch, and we can see what we can do to help. But I, I would first recommend applying earlier rather than the last minute, and switching browsers uh, when you're doing your applications if you're having problems with a Mac. Okay, thank you. Um, my organization's fiscal year end is June 30th. We will not have our audited financial statements available until well after July 31st. Uh, well after July 31st. Should I submit audited financials from the previous fiscal year, so that's the year ending June 30th, 2017, and draft financials uh, for the most recent fiscal year? Uh, it's Stephanie, I'll take this one. So if, uh, because the, um, this specific example with it being June 30th, um, if the application was submitted between June 1st and June 30th, the previous fiscal year would be June 30th of 2017, and that you could submit those ones if it's going to be a problem. If you're not going to have your stuff together in time and you are going to be applying after that June 30th date, then yes, please do. Um, I would submit your 2017 audited. I would send in draft ones for the current year. And then I would just put in a caveat that um, you will provide the audited financial statements once they are ready after June, July 31st. But those provided can't be they're mailed. ready. Per yeah, provided they're be ready before October 30th, 30th, 31st, when the yeah. decisions are made. Okay, so it sounds like they should be in touch with your branch if, if that's their situation and, and they're planning on sending something in after the, the deadline because they won't be able to access the grant application. That's right, process. they really should submit, they should apply on June 1st, so prior to hitting their year end, and then they can avoid all this um, uh, uh, drama with the year end. Okay. So if they apply on June 1st, their prior year's June 30th financial statements are totally acceptable and uh, will not negatively impact their uh, application in any manner. Excellent. Good to know. Thank you. Um, a different question. Subsectors. Uh, you choose a sector and then you choose a subsector. They haven't had definitions in the past. Have they been clarified? Uh, and, and how much does getting exactly the right subsector influence the success of your application? You want to take that one? Do you know? Um, I'm not sure that there's definitions of the subsectors. Um, I don't believe that there is. Um, the, the best thing to do is to try and select the appropriate one. Um, I know that in the regular program, um, we do try to catch that. And if we believe that you've put yourself in the wrong subsector, we will allow, we will notify you that in your grant notification letter. 
Um, if you're a previous recipient and you haven't been told that you're applying under the wrong subsector, you're probably applying under the correct one and you, it's probably okay. There won't be any uh, negative ramifications if you do pick the wrong subsector. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, in terms of permits, so say you're building something and you know you're going to need some permits, do you have to provide those permits ahead of time with your application or can you just list the permits that you know you're going to need? I hope I'm doing this question justice, by the way. I'm using my imagination to think of what it could be like. I, I don't know if you want to take this one. I would think it's, it's just like every, every other piece of documentation you provide as part of this program. The more you can provide us, you know, assurance that you a either have funding or b that you have permissions or c that you have uh, permits to, you know, to uh, use this land or, um, you know, like a, a, a building permit to actually do it. The more of that stuff you can demonstrate that you actually have in hand and give us a copy, the better you're actually going to score. Um, if it's something that, you know, is pending, like let's say it's taking a while at City Hall to actually get the building permit, but, you know, they can provide you with assurance that it's going to happen, you're just like 20th in the queue, then I would say provide us with that. That's the best you can do at that point. Okay, and um, I just, I'm trying to go through some of the other questions that I'm receiving because they're piling up and I can't get to them. Um, but for multi-stage projects, for example, if you're doing a fairly large build, you might have some uh, engineering costs in year one, and then you might have the building costs in year two. Are those uh, sort of pre-building costs eligible for capital grants? So if you, you know you're going to have engineering, you might have you know, site remediation and things like that before you can actually start building. How are those pre pre project costs eligible or are they? Uh, that will all form part of your one application. So all those costs required to complete that project need to be included and added up together. You can't, we, we won't take the pre uh, built uh, portion of any project as, as a separate um, application. So it, if, if there's a site remediation that's required, that has to go in with the rest of the uh, costs that are required in order to complete the project. So it's one application per project from A to Z. Okay, thank you. A uh, question about uh, the nonprofit transitions to the Societies Act. Um, so at some point in the last few years, nonprofits were required to do a transition transition with their bylaws and their constitution. Some of them did it early, some of them are just getting to it now. Does that change uh, the, the two-year requirement of the bylaws? Or do all the programs need to resubmit their bylaws and their constitutions with the proof of transition? Um, okay, so if your organization has already transitioned to the New Societies Act and provided those documents to the branch um, through the regular application, um, you do not need to submit them. If you have transitioned to the New Societies Act, um, but you haven't submitted those, even if there are no changes to your constitution and bylaws, please still submit those because we do check BC online and so we will see that you have transitioned and we won't know whether or not that there are changes. Um, and does that, does that make sense? I wasn't the person who asked the question. So if the person who asked that question wants to follow up with you, you um, Mike, do you want to put the, the contact information back up? That way people yeah. can write it down. Yeah. Yeah. So I, there we go. That's the a good important thing. Piece, the important piece is, is if you've already transitioned and submitted those documents within the last two years, it still does not need to be submitted because we have them on file. Okay. If you've submitted your transition documents and you have not submitted them, even if there are no changes, submit them anyways. Okay. If in doubt, submit them. Sounds good? Yes. Yeah. Okay. If you're not sure if you're not sure if you've submitted in the last two years, submit okay. them. Okay. Um here's an interesting You're question. better off to do that than to not, because like we said, everything has to be in. You get one shot at this. Yes. So if you're at all in doubt, when in doubt it. included. Okay. Yeah. Can infrastructure funded by this grant program generate revenue for the nonprofit? or fundraising for charitable organizations. What if you will rent out part of your building? That generates revenue. 
and it it uh, allows you to it it supports the sustainability. So it's technically raising revenue, um, but it's it's so part the, of yeah. <laughs> that's a tricky the, one. The, the capital grant is aimed at helping the organization, the not for profit, deliver its programming, and that's that is the ultimate uh, criteria for this successful application. If an application comes in and says, we're going to build a building and then rent it out at market rates to to anybody and anybody that can afford them, um, that's you're not delivering a program of any sort to the community. So that would not be an eligible project. Okay, so, so we you, want to see the community benefit uh, related to the organization's programming. Okay, so if part of the, uh, say you're building a center that'll be used during the day by your programming in the evening, it's free, but you're going to provide it at below market rates to other community groups, uh, you will get revenue from it. But if it's below market rates, then it has a community benefit. Is that going to work? Yes. Yeah. So the principal purpose with the pro with this capital project was to deliver its programming. Okay. And of course, there can be there can be some spinoffs from that that. Uh, you know, we, we don't want to see assets uh, underutilized uh, when they can be utilized. Okay, but you're not going into the landlord business. Into the what land business? The landlord land business. No. no, no, absolutely not. These okay. are this is for the organizations to deliver their programming. Okay. Whatever that programming is. Okay. Um, someone has asked, what's the difference between your project budget and list of expenses? Is there is that two different things? Um, there's a project budget and then there's the use of the grant funds. And so your budget should include costs that are not intended for grant usage because it, there should be a matching contribution from you. So if you were getting, say, $25,000, you're requesting $25,000 from us, we want to see how you intend to spend that $25,000. And so that's different from the whole project because we'd like to see what the whole project is going to cost total. Okay. Can you submit a spreadsheet that perhaps has the total project cost and then has certain lines, you know, have another column that says this is the amount of this cost that we're including in our, our grant request? That way you only have to do one spreadsheet, basically. Uh, you can present the information to the branch how you would like. Um, just be aware that uh, it needs to be clear in the analyst. Um, you want the analyst to be able to understand the documents that you're providing. Okay, great. Um, okay, now I'm going to try and go through some of these other project eligibility questions. I know we have about 10 minutes left, and I'm going to again repeat that if your question hasn't been answered, um, they are being collected and our staff will go back through and try to get back to you on questions that weren't addressed or just to you know and if you if you really haven't heard and you really have a burning question you can always contact the branch and ask um so some questions this is really hard because they all seem really individual um around leases we had a number of, of questions around leases so is funding available if you're renovating and you have um, a five-year lease? The ideal is 10 because uh, again we're looking for a project that's going to you know have a long-term benefit to the community so we're looking for a long-term lease with that. If it's less than 10 uh, then you know provide us the documentation for what you have and um, we'll assess it like we will every other piece of your application. Okay um, and so Renovations, uh, how are they? Can you just review how renovations are treated as opposed to acquisitions? Okay, so a renovation is part of the facilities category, so that's the first of the three project eligibility categories that I mentioned. So if uh, you deliver your programming in, you know, whatever your space is now, let's say, let's we keep talking about daycare, so let's continue on with daycare. So you need to make renovations to your daycare facility to keep it up to, to par. So that's potentially uh, eligible for capital project funding for us. So you would just, um, as part of your project budget and part of your submission, you'd need to provide us with, uh, you know, a listing of what it is you need to do to renovate that facility and what your request is from us in terms of the contribution you'd like us to make towards that. 
if it's not your facility, say an, another organization owns it and you lease it, but that other organization um, perhaps has limited membership or, or maybe, you know, the owning organization wouldn't be an eligible organization, but your organization is. Does the fact that that building owner not qualify, does that, is that going to affect the success of your grant application? So we're getting to some very specific <laughs> I know. situations here. Uh, we don't know if there's a lease. We don't know if there is a lease, how long the lease is for, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, this would be a very difficult question to answer in, uh, on, on a call like this. Okay. Because the, the, the criteria are so many that, that we haven't been able to even look at. Right. Okay. So follow up with the branch if that was, there was a couple people who had similar questions to that. Um, some people asked questions around software or uh, computer hardware or technology lab or things like that. Where does that sit with this program? Those would be considered acquisitions. So those are potentially fundable. Okay. Um, is funding all or nothing? So is, is it that if you've applied for 50,000, um, you might receive 40,000 or is it going to be a yes, no? decision. Are you going to get the entire amount you asked for or none? Is that the question? Yeah. Is it all or nothing? So will will the when you're looking at allocating the funding, will you be offering lesser amounts than what people applied for or will you just say yes or no on their whole? Well, it's, it's based, well, like David said, there's a series of assessment criteria that are applied to it, right? So one of them is financial needs. So your project budget, uh, the financial information you provide needs to clearly clearly identify what your financial situation is and then the decision is made based on that. But, but it, it really is a yes or no situation. So you, any organization that is approved for a capital grant is going to get the amount that they requested in that, in that capital grant. And that's to make sure that that project does get completed. And that's where all the other portions of the of the application come into play the budget the risk matrix the project timelines all that comes together including uh, the funding amount okay thank you that uh, that's a very important thing to know okay um we've got about five minutes and i'm just going to scan through a number more questions have come in and a lot of them are very specific to a person uh, who either has left the webinar <laughs> or uh, things. Um, someone asked, can a new nonprofit apply? So does it, does it matter how long you've been an uh, organization for? Uh, yeah, no, uh, new organizations can apply, um, you know, as long as you meet the eligibility criteria, um, as mentioned before, and it's again in the sector guide if you go to our website. Um, but a new uh, nonprofit would be eligible. But again, um, if you've never received funding from us, please contact the branch so we can get you registered into our system. Okay. Um, great. <laughs> I'm trying to get this is like do 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 Jeopardy. What are what are the questions that are going to get into the last <laughs> bit here? Um, is there a benefit for two nonprofits or two organizations? to partner on projects. Does that affect the ranking? It doesn't impact the ranking, but if that's a method by which they can accumulate the funds, uh, partnerships are allowed. However, there will always have to be a, a lead partner, uh, and that par lead partner will be the one that does all the communications with the branch, submits all the paperwork, and so forth. Okay, so each organization uh, if it's one project, one organization should apply, not each organization who's a partner apply for part Correct. of it. Correct. Uh -huh. And <laughs> the, lead partner would, the lead partner would describe the other partners in the application so that the branch understands who is involved and what the contributions are. Okay. Thank you. Um, with, with four minutes left, I guess I'm just going to turn it back to you to say if you have any more uh, comments. Um, uh, most of the other questions that have come in are very specific. Can I do this project? Can I do this project? Can I do this project? So. Yeah. 
Yeah, so those, those types of questions, like, so I've left up the contact us slide there on the screen. So, you know, if you do have very specific questions um, about your project in terms of whether it's eligible, whether, you know, whether this would be something you should, you know, uh, want to throw your hat in the ring, first step is to go to the website there, check through the, the sector guide, uh, clearly the project sector guide, clearly. So we've, we've walked you through it all at a very high level. and. Um, you're going to get more detail, obviously, if you go to the website and look through that sector guide. So I would start there. And if that doesn't answer your questions, by all means, like reach out to us um, either by email or by phone, and uh, we're happy to, to to take your inquiry and try to help you out as best we can. Um, you know, we're 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 hoping to get uh, great applications. Uh, we got great applications last year, and we want to we want to continue that run, and we want to make sure that uh, projects that uh, do get funded are going to have great benefits to the communities and um, and and whatnot. So uh, we want to position groups to be successful with that process. So uh, yeah, we're here to help uh, how we can. And um, if you do have any other questions for us, you can reach out to us at any of those methods, and we're happy to help out. So yeah, I guess that's about it, Susan. It's been great. So if there are any other questions, please feel free to fire those our way. And um, I'm not sure what the process is in terms of getting a recording of this, but we will be posting it to our website. So you're welcome to go back to that at your leisure and share it with uh, friends, family, whoever, who never had a chance to uh, tune in today. And um, yeah, so I guess that's about it for us. Just I'll mention the yeah. guideline is a, is a downloadable PDF. Right. So you can share it amongst your friends. Yeah. Thank you. And that does. So we look forward to uh, the sector opening. Today is May 23rd. So uh, just a little over a week from now, the, the floodgates will open and uh, we're looking forward to seeing some applications from groups in the community at that point. So thanks very much, Susan, for hosting us today. It's been great. Well, thanks, you guys. It's been fun working with you. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. I, we'll, we'll close things off now. Everything is going to close. So thanks to everyone for attending. And um, like we said, the, the webinar recording will be posted soon and uh, we'll try to get some of those questions answered. If your question hasn't been answered, feel free to contact the branch. So thank you very much to the Community Gaming Grants branch for the webinar. Take care, everyone. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.